All right, at any rate, um, we're going to pick up where we left off on the quiz, and we are going to um, extend it to, to use some of the other controls that we haven't used so far. Now, someone pointed out, like, you have a lab due today that was supposed to use one of the controls that we hadn't talked about in class. If you need a few days to, to take what we learned today and get it sorted out, that's fine. I'm very flexible on, on due dates, you know. And it is, it's hard to time exactly where I'm going to be at the lecture versus when the labs are due. So I do my best, but every once in a while I might end up, uh, uh, might be off by like a, a lecture or half a lecture. So let me go download that. I typically buy, by the way, like the almost newest version of something. So like I have a LG G2. Well, that had been out for a while when I got it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like that gives a chance to like see if there's any problems with it and read the reviews and all that. Plus, it's a lot cheaper right. than than the, like the brand newest, um, brand newest one. Okay. because I'm being recorded and broadcasted to the world at YouTube, but I love Lorain County Community College. I do. This isn't retail, though. This is not retail. That's true. There's That's true. good jobs out there. Retail. This is, a, in a way, kind of a service if you think about it. Pardon me? This it, is a service if you think about it. It is kind of a service. So, yeah, in that regard, it is. It's not retail, but it is a, a service uh, thing. You have to deal with equally disturbing <laughs> You're enriching the minds of young people and occasionally... Yeah. Um, there are parts of the job I don't like, but almost none of them have to do with dealing with students. I, I'm not crazy about grading. I've always joked that um, I teach for free and they pay me for going to meetings and grading stuff. So like this is just this is volunteer work. I would do this anyhow. Like if I retired. I would still be here next Thursday, like, you know, and, and, and doing this if, if they didn't kick me off of campus. But I would stop going to any meetings, and I would not grade anything. <laughs> All right, let's go and open website quiz. And we went and we put different validators on here. If I'm not mistaken, we put a required field validator and we put a <coughs> compare validator. And compare validator is kind of the oddball because it can either compare two controls to make sure that they're equal or one's greater than the other. It can also compare to see if it's something's a certain data type. One thing I could have used, uh, but I didn't, well, I'm sure we'll at some point in the semester use it. But I didn't use a range check where you check to see if a value is between X and Y. So like I could have put in, since we were guessing a year, I could have get, put in something between, 
where they, where they had to choose between 1950 and 1999, let's say. Um, just in case someone mistakenly saw that sci-fi show, what was it called, Space 1999 or something like that, where they blew up the moon? Yeah, well, then you'd also have to have a, a compare validator in that case, wouldn't you, to make sure? That no, because the, the range validator also does that, that type comparison okay. as well. It, it, it won't be explicit. It won't say, hey, you need to enter a number, but it will say, hey, that's not in the range between, and it, that should be enough for, for that. But anyhow, yeah, we'll skip that one for now. You can you can experiment and try it on. Again, um, you know, the one thing um, that, that I say um, a lot is, you know, this is, you know, we, we call the period after this our lab period. And what do, what do you do in labs? One thing that people do in labs is experiment. So experiment. Take this example and redo it with a range uh, validator instead of the, the, the other kind of validators. I think with the range validator, we could probably get rid of the required field validator too. I think. But anyhow, we'll see. All right, I'm going to add a second question to my quiz. All right. And what I'm going to do is the right version? Because it doesn't have the hint on it. Oh, I noticed that. I downloaded the, I uploaded the wrong, version. the wrong version. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I do apologize for that, but not too strongly because that will give you a chance to try to recreate that in lab. All right. Let's go in, since there is no validation on here, I probably grabbed my original instead of grabbing the altered one. Um, let's go in, let's add a range validator then. get rid of the zip file right now so I don't repeat that mistake. So I'm going to go in and select that I want a range validator. And I'll put in for the error message must must be between 19 50, let's say, in 1999. That'll serve as sort of a hint, all right, besides everything else. Uh, the control to validate, again, it doesn't deal with the, the physical proximity to it. In other words, the fact that this validator is next to that text box doesn't mean that they're linked together. You have to actually explicitly say the control to validate is text answer. You have to put in the maximum and minimum value. And here's where alphabet, alphabet, alphabetizing these things works against us, right? Because the minimum value is below the maximum value. So you have to put the maximum value on top and the minimum value down here, which is a little counterintuitive. But once you realize that, you'll be OK. The other thing, yes? Is that inclusive or between? That's a great question. I, I think it would include those. The other thing that we have to do is we have to specify the type of data. And in this case, this is, we're going to call it an integer because it's not really a full date. Why do we have to supply the type of data? You might want to use it in the calculation. Not the validator, really. Well, well, yeah, maybe, but there's another reason. So it expects only a number. In yeah, it, it'll do that. But also the rules for comparing things are different if it's a string versus a number. In other words, what is greater? What is greater? 
What is greater? Ten or two? Okay, good. I was afraid people would be suspicious of answering that and, and, and just sit there looking at me. Ten is greater than two if we interpret these things as numbers. If, the, if we know that they are integers and 10 is equal, is greater than 2. What if, however, I'm comparing the string 1, 0 and the string 2? Which is greater? 1 comes first. 1 comes first, like in alphabetical order. So 1, 0 would actually be less than 2. Because it's just like alphabetizing, right? Adams comes before Baker. Why? You look at the first character, and A comes before B. Well, if you're interpreting these as strings, 1 comes before 2, therefore 1, 0 is less than 2. All right? So, for all those reasons that we gave, to make sure that they only allow to put uh, integers in, and, um, and most importantly, so that it does the comparison properly, you need to de designate the, the kind of data that you're going to put in there. So let's run this and let's see what we got. If I put in 1937, tells us it must be between 1950 and that. If I put in, it also tells me it must be between that. If I leave it blank, actually I stand corrected. I still would need to put a required validator in there. I, I, I somehow was mistaken about that because, again, it could be that if you put the year that your driver's license expires, for example, on a form, if you don't have a driver's license, you know, you would, uh, you know, you could leave it blank. But if you put a year in, it might have to be within a certain range of years. Yes? What happens with 1950? What happens in 1950? Excellent question. 1950... It, it, it did take it, yeah, so it's inclusive. In 1999, I would assume also is inclusive. So it's between 1949 and 2000. I guess it depends on your perspective. It would be greater than 1949 or greater than or equal to 1950. I would prefer to look at it as greater than or equal to 1950. All right, but, yeah, you, whatever way but 2,000 does give an error. All right. Let's go and let's add another quiz question here. And let's make a different kind of answer. I'm going to copy the code. And... When did Okay, Google ready, Alan. <laughs> when did John Glenn orbit the Earth? I'm guessing it's nineteen sixty three, but I I'm not really sure. February twentieth, nineteen sixty two. Sixty two, really? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm, I'm just copying the code, and I'm going to start out with a text box in here, and I'm going to run it to make sure that my UI is correct. I have two submit bad answer buttons. I should probably get rid of one of them. 
I can't emphasize enough the benefit of just doing a little piece, testing it, and then move on. Here's a chance for me to insert the obligatory when I was a kid story. When I was going to Cleveland State the first year that I was going to Cleveland State, all right, in the late 70s, all right, before some of you were born, all right, um, towards the end of the semester, we used punch cards, you know, a deck of punch cards for our programs, and if you submitted a program now, if I put it in the card reader now, I, m I would get the results in some cases tomorrow morning because it was handling so many batches and things, the processing was so slow and all that. In an environment like that, I'm going to be darn sure that I have really thought through and have dotted my I's and crossed my T's because if this doesn't work, my next chance will come tomorrow to run it and get it on Saturday. Yeah, no IntelliSense on a punch card and if you, uh, you know, all that, and plus the whole thing of I walked to Cleveland State from Lorraine barefoot uphill <laughs> in the snow over a rocky path with broken glass on it. All right, so it's like a kid's book. yeah, exactly. It explains a lot, actually. Yeah, it does explain a lot. So for there, you agonized over every little detail before you submitted it. Now you don't have that. You can put in a tiny snippet of code, run it, and test it. Now, I will say, it's a mixed blessing. Because I think coding in that environment has its advantages. And the advantages are you really think about what you're doing as opposed to just taking silly guesses about, well, maybe this will work. Try it. Maybe this will work. Try it. You really had to think through your code, and you pretended you were the computer and would walk through a flow chart, and you would plan it and all that. So that was the advantage of that. The downside of that is you kind of had to solve the whole problem or try to solve the whole problem in one shot. So hopefully, you guys can take the best of both worlds. You guys can plan, think through what you need to do, so you're not just flailing and taking guesses at things and you're doing things systematically. But you have the advantage, your advantage, your, or the advantage coding today, is you don't have to do everything in one swoop. You can do a bit, test it, go on to the next part, test it. So if you can marry, you know, if you can marry the best of both worlds like that, then, then you can be a super developer. All right. So now let's run it, now that I've gotten rid of the one button. <coughs> and... Put that and let's put nonsense in here. And of course, it's not grading that second one yet because I haven't put any code in there, but it did grade the first one. All right. So let's go in. And put in our code behind the code necessary to grade the second one. So I can copy all this code. One thing that's important as far as lining up the code, again, is doing a good job lining up the braces so that at a glance I can see this brace which indicates the beginning of the function matches up with this brace down here. And this brace which indicates the beginning of the class matches up with this brace here. And you can even expand or contract them depending on what you need to look at. So for example, if I had, uh, if I knew that I had, if my button submit click code was correct, and I was working on another aspect of the problem, I could simply collapse this function and not worry about it until I needed to go and make changes to it. So I, it, it sort of removes that distraction from you. All right. So if text box two, and again I'm 
being bad. I am not following my own advice and not following a convention, but hey. If text box 2 text equals 1962, label 2 text equals results, label 2 class equals that, label image 2 visible is true, image 2 results. Be nice if I adopted a consistent scheme for naming these, but oh well. All right, so now I am set with the two questions. So I can say 19. 69 and 1962 and submit answer and I got both of them being correct. All right. Now we want to vary things up a little bit. All right. I want to make it so instead of a text box for the answer, let's give me um, a drop down, for example. All right. So I can go in to the UI, and here's where I'm going to go and do it in Design View, right? Because Design View, um, in my mind, is more straightforward to do it this way. I don't have to do it this way, but yeah, it's, it's simple. So I'm going to get rid of that, and I'm going to go and drag a drop down list to it. Notice when I do that, by default it says unbound. Unbound means that it's not connected to any database objects. In this case, we're going to hard code the choices in. I'm going to put in four dates, or four years rather, and the user can pick which one they want. But in other cases, the choices might come from a database. For example, if I was scheduling classes, let's say, I might have a list of departments. Well, I wouldn't want to add the departments hard-coded. I would want to simply be able to go to a database table, get a list of all the departments, and show that list that way. All right? We're not quite ready for that point yet. Even in this example, it would be great if we were pulling the possible answers from a database. It would be very easy to do that. A quiz, in fact, would be a good example of a project if you build on it a little bit to store the questions and answers in a database and so on. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to click on this little um, sort of arrow, and I'm going to pick not choose data source because that's what I'd pick if I was linking it to the database, but I'm going to pick edit items. All right. And here's where we can add items. Now, again, here's where it's important to remember that the HTML involved here. For a drop-down list, a drop-down list translates an HTML to a select statement. All right. And a series of options. Associated with each option, there's two things. There's what the user sees and what the computer is going to see, what the scripts are going to see. Now, in this case, I could do it where it's the same thing. In other words, I could display 1962 and I could put in what the computer sees as 1962. But I'm going to make it a little difficult and I'm going to spell out the year just to demonstrate that. So I'll go in and click Add. And the text I will put in is 1960. I know it's goofy, but that's what the user is going to see. The code behind the scenes I'm going to put in as 1960. And I always do that. I should click Add again and put in 
19, <coughs> 61. So this, it'll be spelled out as that, but the output will be... Yeah, it'll be, the user will see the words. Behind the scenes, the coding is going to be seeing the, the value, okay. the numeric value. I could actually see either, but typically what I'm interested in is the, is the, the value. And again, sort of foreshadowing, think about databases. And any of you that have had the database class knows that sometimes you use, um, like in what an access are called auto number keys, or keys that are just like generated, a sequential number. Um, so for example, um, if there was a faculty table, all right, there might be a faculty ID number that every faculty member has a unique faculty ID number. But no one knows what my faculty ID number is, right? Everyone knows my last name is Zellers, or at least everyone in this class, <coughs> right? So what the program, the script might require my faculty ID number to properly do the search, to look for all the classes I was teaching, let's say. Yet no one's going to know if they simply showed a list of faculty numbers, no one's going to have any idea who is what. So I'm going to show in the drop down the name, behind the scenes I'm going to store the faculty number. And again, when we, when we bind these things to databases, this will be a concept that we're going to use. So I'll then do the next one. And finally, we'll do the last one. All right. So there we have our drop down. Enable post back. We're going to ignore that for the time being. Let's look at the code here, because we're going to have to change it. Because we've gotten rid of that text box. All right. <coughs> What's that drop-down called? It is called drop-down list one. Well, for at least a modicum of consistency, I'll call it at least drop-down list two, because it's question two. All right. Now. Before I was saying if text box 2 equals 1962, go and do this. What do I have to do now? I have to point to that drop down list, right? How do I point to that drop down list? Through its ID. So I say drop. Down list 2. Dot text okay selected value. actually te it appears that text or selected value will work which I think is a new I think it's well selected index returns the numeric value of the index. In other words, in other words, selected index would return a zero selected. Thank you. If I use selected index, that would return a zero if I pick the first one, a one if I pick the second one, a two if I pick the third one, and so on. And sometimes you might want that, all right? But in my case, I want to actually compare the value of the selected item. So I say selected value. And apparently I can also do text, which is something new one on me, all right? So now I go and run this, and I could say 19, 
69. And I can pick 1962, submit answer, and it tells me they're both correct. Again, it's important to view the HTML for these periodically because if we look at this, we view the source, we'll see our drop down. somewhere. Here we go. There's our select, there's our option in value, what the computer sees, and then between the start and end option tag is the actual text that the user is going to see. So this is actually writing JavaScript in there for those validators. Yes. It, again, it, what does the ASP.NET controls make? The ASP.NET controls make a web page. What can be on a legit web page? HTML, JavaScript, CSS. So again, even going back to that calendar example where we could click through the next month, the next month, the next month, in addition to the HTML and CSS it generated, it did, did generate little snippets of JavaScript to allow the navigation between months. Question on this. How can I test if a drop down, how, how can I make sure that they've answered this question? Let me put it that way. I saw how I could make sure they answered the first question, right? I can put a required field validator. How can I make sure they've answered this question? But what if my answer was the first selection? What if I oh, thought? You didn't, oh, you didn't put, please make a selection. Right, there. exactly. Uh, oh, oh, okay. So you're, at, you're absolutely on the right track, though. What I could do is I could put a dummy selection to say, hey, enter, please, please make your selection. And then I could use a required field validator and tell it which one the dummy selection is. So let's go and do that. So let me go here, and let me go and edit data source. I didn't want to do that. Edit items. I could add an <coughs> option that says, please select answer. And I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to make the text and the value be the exact same thing here. All right. Now, I'm going to move that up to the top of the list. So I can use those arrows to put that at the top of the list. But you could actually leave it there and tell it to show that item. Yeah, but that would be confusing. Right. Yeah, that would, that would be confusing. By default, the first option of a, a drop-down is the one that's selected. Otherwise, I would have to do something to make sure it was. And I could do it, but it would be goofy to me to like have that in the middle of the list or the end of the list. Yeah. It makes more sense to have it at the, at the top. All right, so now I'm going to put a required field validator on. Now remember, this is a little bit different than what you might have seen in C Sharp because a drop down on a web page always has a selected value. It's either what they selected, or what was coded to be selected, or by default, it's the top item on the list. So you can't say, gee, if there's no selection in the dropdown, like you, I, I think you can in C Sharp. There's always a selection. But what I can do is I can test to see if that selection is the dummy selection or not. So how do I do that? I'm going to go to my required field validator. I'm going to say must make a selection. And when I scroll down, I pick the control to validate. Drop down list. And I put in the initial value. In that way, it will know that if it still has the initial value, then the user didn't change anything. 
and therefore they have not made a selection. So I'll go in here and say please select value which matches the value of the first item on the list. So therefore, if when I'm done, it matches please select value, then it knows that nothing has been selected and it knows that I have not made a selection. Yes? Please select answer. Please select answer. Very good. What do you suppose would happen if, I, if you didn't catch that and I had please select value? It wouldn't blow up, you're right, but the validation wouldn't work. It would accept please select answer as a legitimate answer, all right, because it would not know that that's just the dummy answer at the top because I didn't describe the dummy answer at the top correctly. <coughs> so now this should work. So... It tells me, please make a selection, and then if I pick, make my selection, it tells me if I'm right or wrong. Now, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to redo that first one as a set of radio buttons. All right? Because that would be another way to show a question on a quiz, right? What are your form controls? You have text boxes. You have drop-down lists, you have radio buttons, you have check boxes, you have text fields, and then you have some other ones. All right. Radio buttons and drop-downs, for the most part, logically, are the same thing. That is, they give you a list of options that you have to choose from and you are um, limited to those those options. A text box is for one line of free free form text. A text area is for a longer multiple line text and a checkbox is simply a boolean true or false. Um, What was I thinking? The difference between a drop down and a radio button is largely a matter of real estate. With uh, radio buttons, you see all of the <coughs> options right there. With a drop down, you have to click on the drop down to see the list of the options. But it takes less space. So if you had a bunch of options, like for example, state that you live in it'd be better to have a drop-down because otherwise it'd be 50 radio buttons. All right? It'd be better to have a, one drop-down that, that when you clicked on it showed a list of 50 things. If you have something where there's a handful of choices, it might be better to use radio buttons because you see all of them. How do you think we're going to use radio buttons and drop-downs when we start linking this guy up to a database? Right, that's true, but, but how are we going to use, when would we use a drop-down, for example, instead of a text box, if we're talking about something linked to a database? You would use a drop-down when you're, when you're trying to return something from, from the database, maybe like a SQL statement or something? Or like but you could do that with a text box, you too. Want to make a pre item. Okay, when you only want to have a list of predefined things, can anyone think of an example? Like uh, if you had to pick a color, blue, red, green, purple for your favorite color, right. and you only could select those four, right. and they were already predetermined. Exactly. If, if, for example, um, I had a choose your major on a student form. Now, you can't just put anything in. My major is... What was the controversy last week? Teenage Mutant Ninja Thir Turtles. Come and think about it. We were an argumentative bunch last Thursday as well. Yeah, All right? So it, it is, I think, it's the end of the week yeah, for everyone. Like, is this a philosophy course? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. So 
you can't pick anything as your major. There's a list of majors, all right? Is that list of majors hard-coded? I sure hope not, right? Because we add new majors periodically, and it would be a shame if you had to go and change all those programs every time we add a major. Instead, I would think there'd be a nice database table somewhere that said, here's a list of things that you can major in. Now, if we add a form, like a, a, an application or an application to graduate or whatever online, and you were asked to select your major or majors, it shouldn't be a free-form text box. Why? Well, because even if you didn't want to major in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, one person might type in CIS, one person might type in CISS, one person may spell out computer information systems. So you want to lock that down into a certain number of predefined choices. Database table, and in that way, they'd be limited to select that. Plus, it needs to yeah, that, that's what I was saying about the consistency of it, right. Okay, so let's go in and let's get rid of the text box here and the validator, and let's put radio buttons. Can now, I, can I ask a question before yeah. you? Whenever I try to, you know, take things out of my code like that, I get problems. Okay, I will get a problem too because... I still have code that references those things, so I'll have to go back and change that. So it's possible that you have code that references them. Like, for example, if I were to look at this right now, it's going to gripe about text answer because I got rid of text answer. Right. Yes? Also, if, if uh, you have a, um, an event that corresponds to that right, control the events, that's a big in the uh, HTML code or in the ASP code, Right. In other words, if I went in and edited and got rid of this button click of it, <coughs> all right, the HTML or the ASPX file would still have that event and I'd have to go back and do cleanup. So there's probably and there's a number of things we have to go in and clean up. We can take a look at specifically those things um, in lab. All right. I'm going to go here and I'm going to add not a radio button, but a radio button list. All right. Typically, you don't want to just add one radio button. That doesn't really make sense. You want to add a radio button list. And what's a radio button? Again, it's, it's like a drop-down. It uh, gives you a list of predefined things, and you can only select one. So I'll go in here and drag my radio button list <coughs> over here. Again, we have the choice. Should look familiar. Edit data source, or choose data source rather, where I could pick and bind this to some database, or edit items, where I can go in and I can put the choices here. Now, here in the interest of time, I'm just going to put in, I'm just going to go with the text and the value being the same thing, because I've already demonstrated that they could be different and how, the, how that works. We have to put 1999, sure. All right, and there we go. Now, notice it stacks them vertically. If you don't want them stacked vertically, as I can say it now because he's out of the room, just like there's an app for that in the Apple commercials, there's a property for that. All right, and the property for that is... Direction, vertical, or I can make it horizontal, and they'll be laid out that way. All right. So now I'm going to have to go in and clean up that code. So instead of text answer one, I can say radio button list one 
that selected value. You know, here's the interesting thing if you think about it for a second. Gee, a lot of the things with radio buttons <coughs> look like a drop down. Well, yeah, because radio buttons and drop downs are kind of the same thing. Not exactly, but kind of. They look different, but they got the same stuff in them. Well, in object oriented terms, those two probably come from some common ancestor. All right? Just like you, you know, you look at a lion and, a, and, and your house cat and Hello Kitty, all right? They all share certain characteristics, right? So you know they all came from some ancestor going backwards through time. You missed an apple joke? You will have to go back, you will have to go back and watch the video if you want to hear it. No one tell them. All right. Yeah. So at any rate, we have radio button list selected value 1969, and this should work like before. Here's one difference between a radio button and a drop down. Looking at the screen, can anyone indicate what one difference between a radio button and a drop down is? Well, at least with the radio button, you can have all of your answers displayed, right? Like on the well, yeah, there's that visual difference. Okay. That's true. I, I can see all of them as opposed to I have to click on the drop down to see all the options there. What's another difference? No -selected there's no pre selected value. In other words, a drop down always has a value, a radio button list doesn't necessarily have a value. So how do I do validation? Well, again, I'm, I'm back, to, back to doing it just like I do it for a text box. So I could go in, and I don't have to do that little put a dummy value in and, and so on. So I could go here, put my required field validator, I can say must select answer. And I can tie it to radio button list one. So now it tells me I must select an answer for that one. Must select answer. Gives me one wrong and one right. And again, I could do more with the appearance of this, but that is up for you to, to do. Last control that we're going to look at is a checkbox. And I could use keeping the quiz theme I could use a checkbox for like a true or false question. All right? That being said, I don't know if I would. All right? Um, it would make more sense to me to simply have a radio button that says true and false or a drop down that said true or false. But I could use a checkbox for other things. Where do you most often see a checkbox on web forms? Are you over 18? <laughs> <laughs> what website do you agree with the terms and conditions? What website do you agree with? I'm looking for a job, so I'm. Right. What kind of job are you looking for? Right. Okay. Please uh, uh, confirm this is legal in your state. Strip club. Okay. If. <laughs> The question, the question where you typically see this is, do you agree to terms and conditions, where it's a yes or no? Where else do you see it that has not been answered? And this one's usually done in sort of a sneaky way. Do you want to receive 50 emails a day from our company? All right. No, check. And, yeah, and, and, yeah, and they have it defaulted to checked or whatever. 
All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a checkbox here that simply shows show uh, percentage correct. All right. Do that just for laughs, right? I mean, I guess I could make a true or false question, but I'll either allow them to show or not show the percentage correct. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to add the checkbox to my page. That's another way, by the way, you can get to the properties of it. You don't have to be in GUI view to get to the properties. I can click on it there. And I'll scroll down. And there's where I can set the default to have true or false, depending on how I want it. I can put text with it. So, show percentage. Correct. All right. Let's run it. Make sure the GUI looks <coughs> the way we want it to look. Normally, you don't validate a checkbox unless it's one of those you have to check it to show that you agree with the terms and conditions or something like that. It, you know, if for example it was a checkbox that says something like I am a resident of Ohio, you couldn't validate that, right? Because you can't force everyone to be a resident of Ohio. They check it if they are, they uncheck it if they're not. So validation is a little different for this one as compared to the other controls. So. I'll put that in there, then I got to use it. So, what I'm going to do is in the code behind, I'll define a variable. That's warning me that I haven't used it, the green squiggly. The green squiggly is not as bad as the red squiggly. That's just reminding you, hey, you created this variable, you probably want to do something with it. Sometimes that annoys me. It's like, just give me a chance already. I just created the variable a second ago, you know. Give me a minute here, you know. But anyhow... <laughs> So there's my number of questions. If I get the first one right, I'm going to increment right by zero. If I get the second one right, I'll increment right by one again. When I'm all done, if checkbox one dot checked, there's no there's no value to it. It's either checked or not. So if it's checked, I want to do the percentage. So I can say percent equals right divided by questions times 100.
then I have to put that somewhere. So I'll create a label here. What's the syntax on this two string business? Two. Repeat, please. Uppercase two. D for double though. Well, you know what? We'll take care of that. We'll make it a double with a capital D. Well, I guess I don't need to. That's weird. And then for good measure, if I don't want to see the percentage, I could make the label invisible or I could just put nothing in there. insult the user and call him a coward for not wanting to see the percentage. So now we have this if coward, if I say show percentage correct, and it shows 50. I didn't get both of them right. Oh, oh, um, of course. That's what the big red X stands for. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Oh, boy. Here we go. All right. Can you do it where you both get them both wrong? Sure. <laughs> It is zero. Well, because typically C sharp doesn't do well with dividing by zero. Well, I'm not dividing by zero. I'm dividing the number correct by two, by the number of questions. So zero divided by two is zero, and one divided by two is is fifty percent, and so on. So, so if there were zero questions, then it'd be a problem dividing. But again, since I have two questions, I'm always dividing by two. Other questions? All right. Um, let me um, let me zip this up and upload it, and hopefully I'll get the right one this time. And we'll see you in the place for experimentation. See? I am going to have to come up with 30 different yep. <laughs> different ways of saying that. You'll thank me for it next semester, though. You can go right back to uh, saying <coughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't teach... Uh, um, What's that course that we open? What's that course built up to take next semester? The one that's only systems development? No, you I do not. You don't teach that course, do you? No. Huffman does. Yeah, Huffman typically does. I kind of like to teach it. You only do, because you know what? I graduate after this semester if that course was. They went all 